hello everyone again welcome to my my talk altered states of consciousness across creative domains inherent in all of us are many possibilities and among those possibilities are the altered states of consciousness we just naturally enter enter during the creative process and um here the create and i call these altered states the umbrella term is the creative trance it's inherent in all cultures throughout time and it manifests in all the domains the arts the sciences sports self-transformation and it ranges from you know our reveries of everyday life to plans that can alter civilization it appears in daydreams night dreams visualizations, meditation, all these focused attention, remembering, planning, absorption, immersion, and flow. And I'm sure many of you have had many of these states. The work today is based on my book, The Creative Trance, Altered States of Consciousness and the Creative Process, published by Cambridge. And it's a book written to be a textbook and a trade book. So. Let's look at um, daydreaming. I think who, who among us has not daydreamed? It's probably the most common altered state of consciousness. So let's look at some daydreams that have changed the world. Albert Einstein, when he was age 16, he dreamt he was riding on a light beam. Uh, you know, daydreamed he was riding on a light beam. And that image formed the basis of his theory of relativity. James Black. Another Nobel Prize winner said about his research, I daydream like mad. Um, Black's work produced the, uh, the beta blocker propanolol that calms the heart and cimetidine that treats gastric ulcers. And he describes his creative process as visualization, calling it an imaginative sense, entirely open-ended and entirely pictorial. Now, I should tell you that this, this is Leonardo da Vinci who got in trouble with daydreaming. Einstein got in trouble with his daydreaming, too, because this is, a, this is an action that starts in childhood. Einstein's parents told him that the boy was slow, always daydreaming, would never amount to anything. Yeah. And um, da Vinci also got in trouble for daydreaming. One of his patrons reported him to... Uh, Ludovico Schwarz, the Duke of Milan, says he just sits there. He does nothing. He does no work. And in <laughs> his defense, da Vinci said, the mind must first conceive what the hand will later create. And his daydream was, his daydream and visualizations were so complete. You see his helicopter, his parachute. This is his early version of a spring-driven car. That's the mechanism. They were so complete that Centuries later, these machines have been built just from his drawings. Here's another daydreamer, Frank Lloyd Wright, and he could visualize his project so completely in his mind that he made very few preparatory drawings before showing his design to a client. But again, in childhood, his daydreaming was so deep that his uncle would have to shout at him to wake him to come out of a daydream. Sometimes an altered state is its own world. And um, this happened with Barbara McClintock, another Nobel Prize winner. She was a cytogeneticist. And she was so involved. I mean, she won her prize for the study of mobility of genetic elements. But when she was doing her research, she felt transported into the cells she was studying. And the, the, uh, they were so familiar to her, she felt they were her friends. Sometimes in a creative trance, it's the outer world that seems more real. And uh, here's the primatologist, Jane Goodall. When she was working in Tanzania with the chimpanzees of Gombe National Park, she said one day it had been raining heavily, and then it stopped raining, and she could hear the insects singing loudly. She could smell the wet hair of the chimpanzee's fur. And she said, everything felt as one, the entire world. 
just as um, American Psychological Association says there are levels of a hypnotic creative trance, there are also levels and aspects of, uh, of, uh, of a regular creative trance, the state we are in in creativity. And there's a light level that would correspond to Sigma, Sigma Mahalia's flow. And there's medium, which is more absorption, and there's very deep. And now we'll look at some deep creative trances. This is the Italian Renaissance painter, Parmigianino. He has self-portraits on the left and on the right. Here, here is Galatio. This is a portrait of a man who commissioned him. They're both wearing red hats. It is just a coincidence. Um, in the year 1538, Parmigianino was working in his studio and he was so absorbed in his work that he didn't even hear any of the commotion going on outside. It was the sack of Rome. He didn't notice anything until the German soldiers were in his studio. But they were so taken with his art that they asked him just for a few watercolor drawings and they left him unharmed. The creative trance is, as a deep level is very prevalent in sports. Here's Rogers, um, here's Jack Snow, and uh, he played for Los Angeles Rams. He described his deep creative trance as an intense concentration and a type of self-hypnosis. He said, if a plane crashed in the stadium, I probably wouldn't hear it until the plane was over. Roger Bannister, running to break the barrier of the four minute mile, he described this experience as a very deep altered state of consciousness. He said there was no pain, just great aim, and the world seemed to stand still or did not exist at all. He said the only reality was the next 200 yards of track beneath my feet. Now, this pain-killing aspect of the creative trance, the analgesic aspect, is very important to people, especially those with disabilities. Here is the folk artist, Maud Lewis, and she had severe juvenile arthritis throughout her entire life. You can see how it affected her hands. And, um, and she, despite all this pain, Maud Lewis said, as long as I have a brush in front of me, I'm all right. And this is one of her paintings, Oxen in Spring. Illness can affect the creative trance very profoundly. This is Ichiku Kubota. He was a, a, a textile designer and a designer of kimonos. You can see this is in his Mount Fuji series on the right. He had an experience of acute hepatitis and was in the hospital for weeks. But he said that experience was the most important thing in my life as an artist. He's, and afterwards, it changed his work completely. He redesigned an ancient um, system of Japanese kimonos and textiles. Sometimes, the creative trance, the altered state, comes in dreams and related states of consciousness, such as the hypnagogic state before sleep, the hypnopompic state, when you're not quite awake, you're just waking up from sleep. This is a beautiful Benin bronze from the Benin people of Africa, and they believed that the deity, Ola Kuhn, inspires creativity through dreams and through daydreams. In Australia, the um, indigenous Australian people, the Aborigines, have a beautiful idea of dream time. This is, an, this is a painting done with dots, painted with dots, and it's called Seven Sisters. It's Orion chasing the Pleiades. And it, um, the Australian idea of dream time is both an altered state of consciousness and a parallel universe of spirits and the divine. Elias Howe invented his sewing machine 
his dream, the, the solution to his sewing machine. He had struggled with it. And everything seemed to be okay except for the needle. The needle wasn't working. His sewing machine wasn't working. And then one night he went to sleep very frustrated. And, in, and he had a dream. And in his dream, he was surrounded by angry warriors who were threatening to kill him. But he looked at them and they were holding spears. But he noticed the spears had holes near the tip of the, of the needle-like spear, not in the middle where he had put it. It was a lucid moment in his dream. And he woke up, he ran and he just to another room in his house and he, he made a needle, model of a needle with a hole near the tip and it worked. And his sewing machine revolutionized the world. It produced mass-produced clothing and great opportunity for women, employment opportunity. Here's Mary Shelley. She was also having a distressed time. She wasn't able to sleep one summer night. And she was just, you know, unable to sleep and trying to sleep with her eyes closed. And with her eyes closed, she had this vision. And it was a vision of a scientist bending over this strange creation. She got a series of images and it became her uh, novel, Frankenstein. And you can see the frontispiece to the 1831 version of Frankenstein on the right. And here is Marian Anderson, the, um, the great singer. And she said that when she, she liked the time before sleep, because it was such a quiet time, she became lost in the, the spirit of the music lost in the mood of the song and um see she also said that uh that her experiences of daydreaming were very very important to her and uh here i'd like to speak briefly about the neuroscience and under <clears throat> linear dynamics and multiple states of consciousness of the creative trance. I go into it more deeply in, in the book, but just to say, give you an overview, uh, that creativity activates multiple brain regions. And there's a heter heterogeneity of creative trance states, and these are through the activation of different brain regions, such as the medial temporal lobe, memory network, the prefrontal cortex, both brain hemispheres, and significantly the course of default mode network, which is associated with divergent thinking and daydreaming. And of course, we also know, depending on the domain of creativity, you can get activation visual cortex, auditory cortex. Um, I'm also thinking for chefs uh, with the activation of, uh, of the nose, you know. Anyway, creativity is associated with the release of dopamines, endorphins, serotonin, and oxycontin. That's why it's so pleasant for so many people. And here's the nonlinear dynamics of the creative trance. It's uh, creative trance is modeled as creative chaos. It brings forth new work and personal transformation. And it has disciplines of chaos theory and complexity theory. And it explains processes like creativity that don't progress in a straight line, not predictable, don't repeat themselves and has the capacity for originality and change. We know that Newton's, the Newtonian clockwork universe, which everybody you know, thinks they operate in, and because they want things to be set and, and, and predictable, is not our multivariate world. Poincaré uh, demonstrated mathematically that when you get three or more variables, you get the n-body system, and that leads to deterministic chaos. We also are capable of multiple states of consciousness. As William James says, normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness, it's just one type. While all about it, there are these other types of consciousness and they, they're just separated by the the screen. And all you need is a requisite stimulus. And I think that requisite stimulus is creativity. 
So what we're going to concentrate on now is something that interests me a great deal. There are multiple locations of consciousness during creativity. And now we'll look first at external sources of The poet Percy Bysshe Shelley said, one after another, the greatest artists and writers say that their inspiration comes to them, their creativity comes to them from beyond the bonds of consciousness. He said this in the early 19th century. Um, Here's Edison. Thomas Edison is shown with the photograph that he invented. And he said, people say I've created so many things. He said, I've created nothing. He said, I'm just a receiving apparatus. I'm only a plate on a, on a record. I just get impressions from the universe at large. Now, Edison gave a, um, a secular explanation to this, but for spiritual people like Srinivas Ramanujan, uh, creativity came from a spiritual source. He said every night the goddess Namagiri would visit him. And she would give him, in his dream, she would give him mathematical formulas. But then, of course, he had to work them all out. You see his notes on the left? He had to work them all out so he could present them to the world. Here is Giacomo Puccini and the um, the soprano Huluke. And she is in the title role of his famous opera, Madame Butterfly. She's singing it at the Dallas Opera House. Um, Puccini said, and he insisted that the music from Madame Butterfly really was dictum, dictated to me by God. I was merely instrumental in putting it on paper. So the, a musicologist asked him, don't you need, you know, great skill to do the work you do? And he said, oh, of course, that's understood. But without divine inspiration, you will accomplish nothing of value. And here's Stevie Wonder, also a very spiritual man. And he said, I'm only being used as a vehicle through which comes encouragement, inspiration, hope, and some clarity. It's an honor to do it, he said. And I never forget the honor. So now we're going to look at multiple states of consciousness during creativity when the work dictates its own creation. And um, I should say that this is not an an example of panpsychism, which I personally believe in, you know, the idea of the conscious universe. This is the idea, it's a personal psychological experience of a creative person who subjectively experiences more than one location of consciousness during the creative process. And uh, let's look at the painter Joan Mitchell. She says, well, I look at my painting sometimes for hours, but eventually the painting tells me what to do. Nietzsche, Frederick Wilhelm Nietzsche said, quote, because it's, um, one hears, one does not seek. One takes, one does not ask. Everything occurs without volition. And here's Rosalind Turek. And um, she insisted, I do what Bach, t- uh, what Bach tells me to do. I never tell the music what to do. And it was obviously a good choice for her because you can see the Rosalind Turek International Bach competition was named in her honor. Yet, why would a creator become an employee of the work she creates? What would be a clinical explanation for the pervasive dictatorships of works of art? You'll find this across domains. Psychologically, in this altered state of consciousness, there appears to be what's clinically called a projective identification, which is an unconscious projection by the artist onto the work in progress. The fusion of artistic projection with the ongoing work actually generates a hierarchy of power in the artist's mind with the external locus of control residing in the art. This results 
in the transfer of creative executive function from the artist to the developing work. Uh, Melanie Klein pathologizes this psychological dynamic in interpersonal relations. She calls it splitting. She says when people project parts of themselves onto others, they give that control to the other person. However, in the creative process, it's non it's non-pathological and um, a widespread and beneficial experience. And would it be advisable or possible to go against the dictate of the of wishes of a work in progress? I can attest from personal experience that for me, it's neither advisable nor possible to want the best result. This is my painting, um, The Pilgrim. My work tells me what to do, even if I don't agree. Uh, I, you see this painting? You see at the bottom? I wanted to paint a nice garden where he could rest. I mean, he's carrying this heavy load. He's all of us, of course, this man. Um, this is a Middle Eastern man, but he's everybody carrying our loads. Anyway, the painting wouldn't let me. I painted garden uh, after garden. Finally, I gave up. I painted the, this, the road. It was continuing in the foreground. It really was the best and only solution. Now, a reason that creative people are willing to accept the dictates of, of the work is that it comes from the unconscious mind and it always results in a better work. And you know our linear sequential waking consciousness is no math match for the vast parallel processing capacity of the unconscious mind. Um, further indication that the creative state is uh, an altered state of consciousness. You see those white stones? I was struggling with the stones, I couldn't get them. Finally, in my mind, I see a, a road of white stones Six months later, on a trip to San Francisco, I saw the exact stones I had painted earlier in New York. This is another one of my paintings called Memories about the things we should let go of that we keep carrying. I was so frustrated with the clouds at the top of the painting. I, you see the structure, I couldn't get them hour after hour. Finally, it was two or three in the morning. I couldn't stop painting and I couldn't stand to look at this painting anymore. So what I did was, I painted without looking away, you know, with looking away like this. I couldn't look at the canvas. I only looked to load my brushes with paint. Eventually, when I did look up, I had the structure of the cloud. And, um, you know, Jung described this. He said, often the hands know how to solve a riddle with which the intellect had wrestled in vain. And, uh, the clouds are now overlaid with glazes, but I think in the state of the creative trance, when the unconscious is so active, we may have more access to implicit muscle memory. And um, one of the most interesting states of creativity for me is the multiple locations of consciousness when aspects of the creative work seem to come alive. And we see this in Alice Walker. And um, they are not only so alive, the, the aspects chart the course of the work. And here the unconscious mind becomes the director, the conscious mind becomes the scribe. Alice Walker was working on her novel, The Color Purple. And then its characters complained to her. They didn't like living in Brooklyn. Too many tall buildings, they said. So she moved to San Francisco. They didn't like it there either. Finally, she moved to Boonton in Northern California, which was a rural setting, much like the setting of her novel. And the characters were happy. They became friendly and talkative again, she said. We would sit wherever I was sitting and talk. They were very obliging, engaging, and jolly. Even inanimate objects in a creative work can come to life. Here's Nikola Tesla, and here's his um, the brush discharge from a Tesla coil on the right. He could visualize so clearly the uh, machines that he invented. He would set them working in his mind, and then he would check later on them to see for, to check for signs of wear. Sometimes 
the creative work evolves in the creator's, the creator's mind without the person even knowing about it. This is Ursula Le Guin, and um, she did her series of Earth Sea novels. You see this one? She thought she had finished after three novels, but then fans wanted more. And she said, I looked inside myself, and what she saw, Earth Sea had changed. It had evolved without her realizing it. So she was so inspired, she wrote another three, three books in that series. And she also had fictional characters that came alive. She said, the one who surprised me most was Cesara. She said, I never knew what she would do or say. I didn't even know what she looked like until she burst out of her red tent. And um, this work coming alive also happened with me. This is called The Eternal Present. And it's an archival print done from a pastel drawing that I made. When I was working on this drawing, I was having a lot of trouble with the hands. She's got a lot of hands. They're all in different positions. In frustration, I just lay down and I, I don't know whether it was a meditative state, hypnagogic state, but this little child came alive for me. She does not exist anywhere else. I mean, she was completely alive and what she was doing was she was opening and closing her hands so that I could see the way her fingers worked. After seeing this, I could get up and I could draw all of her hands accurately. So, looking for psychological explanations of these, you know, seemingly autonomous entities, and she was so real. You could say that they echo distinct as aspects of the personality, you know, and they would relate clinically to parts work and uh, ego state therapy, internal family systems. I do that with my patients. I work with ego state therapy and parts work. It's very effective. But I think this is something else. And we know that there is a very liminal barrier, well, not a divide between the clinical and the spiritual. And I think in this case, it's possible um, they could be what, and here we see Alexander David Neal, and she's in her Lama robes, and there she is in Tibet. She was a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism. And she said, she described an entity called a tulpa, T-U-L-P-A, which is a thought form. And um, it's manifested from concentrated mental energy. And she said she saw, saw a thought form behind a painter that looked just like one of the forms in his painting. And by regarding tulpas as manifestations of the mind, psychology could actually seek to uncover their neural signatures. And um, perhaps someone in our group who does, all of you, some of you do so many wonderful experiments, Maybe you can design neuroscience experiments that can map the dynamics of these seemingly autonomous thought forms during creativity. I think that's where we have to leave it, Toby. Okay. Thank you so, so much. I will say, respect your inner life. Someday it may change the world. And here's my, <laughs> my 